these recirculating systems or RAS, yeah. they feel like a really pivotal step for sustainable salmon, right? A big shift. Oh, absolutely. The efficiency is uh, kind of mind blowing sometimes. You're looking at water reuse rates hitting 98, even 99%. 99%. Wow. Yeah. And what that allows is just incredible control over the environment temperature, water quality, even light cycles, you can dial it all in perfectly. That boosts biosecurity massively, cuts down disease risk compared to sea pens, and importantly, it lets you build farms away from the coast. Right, so closer to the markets then. Exactly, closer to markets, which slashes the carbon footprint from transport, and you know the consumer gets a fresher fish, it changes the whole logistics game. A whole new era of communication in the global aquaculture industry is coming. Now you have the brightest minds in aquaculture right in your pocket. And what's best? You can listen to all of them while driving to a farm, traveling, or running errands. It's never been this good, and it's never been this simple. Welcome to the Aquaculture Podcast Show, the first AI-based podcast in aquaculture, where you'll find cutting-edge insights in everything that's working in aquaculture, nutrition, health, and production. Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today, we're tackling something huge, feeding a growing planet that needs more protein. How do we do that sustainably? Well, one really fascinating answer involves some pretty amazing tech land-based recirculating aquaculture systems, uh, specifically for Atlantic salmon, we're basically talking about engineering entire ecosystems indoors. It's aquaculture, but you know, totally separate from the coast. But as you can imagine, it comes with a whole web of technical and economic challenges. So let's dive in. Yeah, that's exactly what we're here for. We want to really unpack the benefits, which are sophisticated, but also get into the weeds on the, let's say, intricate challenges of scaling up this kind of controlled environment, salmon farming. It's a high level look, yeah. definitely geared towards practitioners in the field. Understanding these details is, well, it's crucial. Why Zenetics turns podcast airtime into brand authority. We don't sell ads, we elevate voices. Curious how far your voice can go to become a reference in the industry and attract more leads? Scan the QR code and discover how we can turn your expertise into unmatched brand authority. Let's transform expertise into influence, starting now. Okay, let's get right to it then. These recirculating systems, or RAS, yeah. they feel like a really pivotal step for sustainable salmon, right? A big shift. Oh, absolutely. The efficiency is uh, kind of mind-blowing sometimes. You're looking at water reuse rates hitting 98, even 99%. 99%, wow. Yeah. And what that allows is just incredible control over the environment temperature, water quality, even light cycles, you can dial it all in perfectly. That boosts biosecurity massively, cuts down disease risk compared to sea pens, and importantly, it lets you build farms away from the coast. Right, so closer to the markets then. Exactly, closer to markets, which slashes the carbon footprint from transport, and you know the consumer gets a fresher fish, it changes the whole logistics game. That control sounds amazing, but Atlantic salmon have that complex life cycle, don't they? Fresh water, salt water. Yeah. How do these systems actually uh, handle that? Replicating those biological cues seems incredibly difficult. It is complex. It's managed through a really structured uh, five-phase production model. You start with egg incubation, then the nursery phase, then comes smoltification. That's that critical, really demanding switch from fresh water to salt water adaptation for the young fish. After that, you've got the post-smolt phase and then finally grow out to market size. And each phase needs different conditions. Precisely. Different salinity, temperature, light, feed. You have to mimic nature very carefully inside the tanks. And look, we've made huge progress, but there are still real challenges. Premature maturation is a big one. Oh, uh, yes. Where they mature too early. Exactly. It can affect, I mean, studies show up to 67% of females in some systems. They put energy into eggs instead of growth. And that directly hits your biomass yield, your bottom line. And it often affects the final quality of the fish, too. So understanding those triggers is key. That and just ensuring smoltification goes smoothly without stressing the fish. Still work to do there. Okay, so that environmental control is clearly the heart of it. But maintaining that precision, especially when you scale up, that must require some serious tech. Let's talk about those technical hurdles. What water parameters need that constant, careful watching? Right. High-performance RES is all about juggling multiple water quality factors. It's not just clean water. We're talking very specific temperatures like uh, 12.8 to 14 degrees Celsius for optimal growth. Precise pH, dissolved oxygen, CO2, ammonia, nitrite, even turbidity. Get any of those wrong, even slightly, and it impacts fish, health, growth, everything. 
And how do you track all that in real time? The sensor technology has really come a long way. We use automated sensor arrays, giving constant feedback. We can even monitor things like stress hormones in the water now, non-invasively. That gives you a heads up before things go wrong. Okay, real-time data is great, but how do you use that data to actually control everything? Especially when it's all interconnected, water chemistry, energy use, biology. What's next beyond basic controls? Yeah, that's the next frontier, really. Integrated control systems. There are major projects like one in Norway looking at AI-driven models. The idea is to move beyond simple feedback loops to, well, predictive optimization. The system learns how everything interacts, water, energy, feed, and adjusts everything together for the best outcome. It's about creating an intelligent self-tuning ecosystem, not just managing separate dials. An intelligent ecosystem, fascinating. But even with smart controls, pathogens are always a risk, aren't they? Biosecurity is better, sure, but not perfect. Things like flavobacterium can still get in. That's a very real vulnerability, yes. Yeah. Pathogens can come in with new water, new fish, even staph. Yeah. Flavobacterium, branchiomonas, they're persistent. So you rely heavily on water treatment. UV light is common, damages pathogen DNA. Ozone is another powerful sterilizer. But those have downsides too, right? You have to be careful. Extremely careful. If you mismanage UV or ozone, you can actually harm the biofilter, the beneficial bacteria that process ammonia. That's catastrophic for water quality. And too much ozone, for instance, is directly toxic to the salmon. It's a constant balancing act. Kill the bad microbes without hurting the good ones or the fish. We're looking at faster diagnostics now, maybe more targeted biological controls or advanced filtration, things that are gentler on the overall system. Okay, let's zoom out a bit. Scaling these up, that's not just about the tech inside the tank. What about the bigger picture, the economics, and the environmental footprint? That's a critical question. Scale brings resource demands. A big facility, say 10,000 tons a year, needs a lot of daily makeup water, maybe uh, 1,200 to 2,400 cubic meters a day. And here's a key point, the energy use. It's significantly higher than sea pens, often over three times higher per ton of fish. Three times, wow, that must show up in things like life cycle assessments, the LCAs. It does. Conventional LCAs often show a higher global warming potential, higher acidification for RAS, mainly due to that energy demand. But, and this is a big but, those LCAs frequently leave things out. They often don't fully account for the benefits. Like what? Like the reduced impact on marine ecosystems, mm -hmm. the much better biosecurity, completely eliminating sea lice issues, or preventing escaped fish from interbreeding with wild stocks. That genetic integration is a real concern with sea pens. So you really need a holistic view to compare these systems fairly. The standard LCA doesn't always capture the whole story. That's a really important point about the limitations of standard LCAs. Still, that high energy figure is a hurdle, perception-wise. How do we square that? And specifically, what about using salt water in these systems? Does that add more complexity? Bridging that communication gap on energy and holistic sustainability is definitely key for the industry. And yes, salt water RAS, adds another layer of challenges. For starters, you need corrosion-resistant materials everywhere. That means higher upfront costs, more maintenance. Plus, getting CO2 out of salt water is less efficient. And the biofilters, the nitrification process, it works slower in salt water. So you need bigger filters or more intensive management. And disinfection is trickier too. Right. Using ozone in salt water can create unwanted brominated byproducts which could be a health concern. So people are developing advanced treatments, things like electrochemical methods for ammonia, using seawater's own magnesium to precipitate compounds, even electrooxidation to zap those uh, off-flavor compounds without stopping production. Lots of innovation happening there. That's some clever chemistry. Okay, let's shift to the fish themselves. Feed efficiency is always crucial in aquaculture. How are salmon doing in RAS? And what about genetic improvements? Well, Atlantic salmon are already amazing converters typically 1.2 or 1.3 to 1 feed conversion ratio. But in RAS, with those optimized conditions, we're seeing FCRs as low as 1.11. Mm -hmm. That's incredibly efficient protein production, less feed waste, lower environmental impact from the feed itself. And breeding for RAS specifically. Absolutely. There's huge potential there. Using advanced genetics to develop strains that thrive in these systems, faster growth, better stress tolerance, maybe even resistance to accumulating those off flavors we mentioned. It's all about fine-tuning the biology for this specific environment. This has been incredibly insightful. It's so clear that these recirculating systems are, well, a double-edged sword in a way, a vital innovation for protein security, definitely, but also packed with complex technical and economic puzzles that need solving. Exactly. It really boils down to integration, the long-term success, the widespread adoption. It depends on pulling together expertise from multiple disciplines. So 
The big question for you, for everyone involved in this sector is this, how do we push for scale rapidly while also constantly refining the technology, making our sustainability metrics truly meaningful and holistic and ensuring these systems are profitable and good stewards of the environment. The dynamic challenge and the answers will likely be just as complex and interconnected as the systems themselves. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to follow the Aquaculture Podcast Show on your favorite platform. And don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook to stay updated on the latest episodes and industry insights. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time.